Now is the perfect time to work at Amazon. They are offering hourly jobs with great pay and even include a large sign-on bonus. No matter where you're at in the job market, you can select from a variety of available roles in your area. Join an exciting work environment and be part of a team that brings smiles to customers every day. To find the job that works for you and some extra cash, go to Amazon.com slash apply. That's Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is proud to be an equal opportunity employer. Hi guys, Sam here, host of the AEW Match Guide podcast. I just wanted to give you all a heads up before you listen to today's deep dive into Cody Rhodes vs. Dustin Rhodes from Double or Nothing 2019. Regular listeners of this show will know that I record these weeks and sometimes even months before they go to air. Today's show was actually recorded back at the start of December and has been scheduled in for this Friday for over a month now. However, given the historical news that broke this week, that Cody Rhodes, the subject of the podcast today, was leaving the company he founded and played a crucial role in building up, I only thought it would be right to record a short update at the end of this podcast, reflecting on his time in the company, how him leaving affects the legacy of this match, and what might be in store for him in the future. So make sure you listen to the end of the show for that special segment. Now hit the music and let's deep dive into Cody vs. Dustin Rhodes. Welcome to the AEW Match Guide podcast, where we deep dive into the best matches in AEW history. Brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network and your host, Sam Brown. Yes, hello and welcome to the AEW Match Guide podcast. I'm your host, Sam Brown. Thank you for joining me. Every week, alongside a special guest, I take an in-depth look at one of the greatest matches in AEW history, taken from the definitive AEW Match Guide, as ranked by over 30 wrestling commentators from around the internet wrestling community. If you enjoy the show today, you can subscribe and rate it on your podcast app of choice. And make sure you check out all of the other great shows on the Social Suplex Podcast Network that cover all the aspects of the world of pro wrestling. My guest today is a special one. For me, one of the GOAT wrestling writers on the internet. The author of two books, The WrestleMania Era, The Book of Sports Entertainment, and The Greatest Matches and Rivalries of the WrestleMania Era. Longtime writer and podcaster for Lords of Pain. It's the Doc Chad Matthews checking in for business once more, and we're looking at Cody Rhodes versus Dustin Rhodes from Double or Nothing 2019. How are you going today, Chad? It's been a minute since we've heard you on the airwaves. It has been a while, and it is a pleasure to be back on the air with you, my friend. I'm thrilled that you're doing this series. This is a great idea. I'm happy to be a part of it, and uh, excited to talk about this match. It's a, it's a personal favorite. Absolutely. I've been sort of slowly doing the really highly ranked matches, and there's very few matches that are more highly ranked than this match. In fact, in the definitive match guide, there was only one match that was more highly ranked than this one. Uh, So I am really excited to get into Cody versus Dustin Rhodes. And yeah, as I said, really excited to have you on with me for this, you know, a really special match. So we needed a special guest for the people who don't know you, Chad, as we said, it's been a minute since you've been doing this thing. Can you let them know what is your history with AEW? Well, for me, AEW came about at a very specific time when I needed something new to keep my wrestling fandom going. Didn't we both? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, that was an era where you and I had many a conversation about that on my podcast back then. Uh, Frustrations with WWE, branching out, finding things like New Japan. New Japan, the Kenny Omega Kazuchika Okada match really put me uh, into thinking beyond the WWE scope. And naturally, I think that fed into a couple of other New Japan related happenings that was really my basis for when AEW came to be. It was more of a, okay, we've got this platform for the likes of Kenny Omega for tag team wrestling led by the Young Bucks. Uh, you've got some of that New Japan stuff I'd grown so fond of to to move into a mainstream spotlight in the United States with a lot of money behind it. I was on board from day one when they did that press conference, listening to podcasts, getting hyped up about some of the guys that were going to be coming into the fold. Um uh, but certainly, you know, going into this show, I, I was a novice to a lot of the talent on it. You know, I had some history with Lucha Underground and places like that and a lot of WWE history and a little bit of New Japan. Uh, but I was excited for something new, excited for something different. By the time Double or Nothing 2019 comes around, I was 
I was here for it. Yeah, Double or Nothing 2019 is a really, really special event. I know AEW, I feel like they've probably had pay-per-views that have eclipsed it just from a pure in-ring perspective and maybe even pure storyline perspective, but it's such a landmark in terms of what they did at that pay-per-view to set the tone, and we'll get into that as we talk about this match, because I think that's a big, a really important part of the legacy of this match and what it did. Uh, But certainly, yeah, this was a real moment uh, in professional wrestling. And there was something special in the air um, that I know captured me. uh, And I I feel like captured you as well. hundred percent agreed. Yeah. Go into this show. A lot of emotions running high about the revolution, the potential for something new that could stick. It was excitement Mm. at a level that uh, I think we all needed. That's that's one of the Mm. things I remember saying on my podcast immediately following that show is, wow, you know, Mm. what what a delivery of something we all needed. A visceral Mm. pro wrestling experience like that had been a while. Yeah. And I think for both you and I, it was like, we want this to happen, but can they do it? You know, they'd kind of shown it all out. They could do something, but you know, now there's now there's an actual company. This is the second one. It's not just the first event. It's the second sort of thing these these guys have done. Can they pull it off and can they make this viable? And can, you know, can they stick the landing? Uh and they're attempting something that I don't know, like now we look at it and it's going into nearly going into its third it's been its third year. Uh and it's it's been a success. But this could have gone very wrong. Uh and leading into double or nothing. Every all everything was in the air. No, you didn't know. I was confident. I hoped, but you know, it was like, are they going to show us the proof? <laughs> and yeah, I think getting into this match, one of the reasons this match is so beloved is because it really does show that you know these guys really can do it uh, and really can fulfill the promise that they have they have given the audience. I, I want to get straight into the match. Um, I think we've teased everyone a, enough. Uh, as we always do here on the AW Match Guide, we're going to give this match its flowers, and it it has some very pretty flowers. Dave melts up, big puffer Dave. He gave it five of the big ones, five of the big stars. Cage match, the notorious hard markers at cage match, um, particularly on someone like Cody, nine point three five. That's a that's a high score. And on the definitive match guide uh, that we did earlier in 2021. It came in second, a clear second um, behind only one other match that we're yet to cover on this podcast, but I'm sure we will at some point. Uh, And this is the highest rated match by both Meltzer on cage match on grapple anywhere for either of these performers for their entire career. So it is, we're talking rarefied air for this match. It was of course uh, a match that both men campaigned for in WWE, but never really got. Now doc, as I said, you've written two books about mostly the WWE wrestling in general up until sort of the mid 2010s, um, but mostly focused on WWE. At the time, uh, there was a lot of talk about these two potentially having a WrestleMania match, uh, but it never really happened. It never really, they never really pulled it off. Do you think that this match would have Dustin versus Cody Rhodes? Do you think this match would have worked in the WWE? And if so, how would it have? How would it have looked? Well, there's no way that WWE would have ever given them the platform that AEW did to maximize what they could have achieved. I think their ceiling in WWE, had they been given the opportunity, would have been probably coming straight out of that 2013 run with Cody and Dusty and Gold Dust when they were fighting the Shield. I mean, if they were going to pull off anything, it would have been around that era. And the best I think we could have hoped for in a WrestleMania type setting would be like a 15 minute mid featured mid card match. And it would have been great. And I, and I think it would have done a lot for the memory of both guys' careers, but I don't think it looks anything like what we got. I, I think a lot of us, by the time that could have happened, had become so jaded with what had happened with Cody, whose career just kind of went off the rails after a while. It seemed like a lot of the potential he'd shown for four or five years was squandered. And by the time WWE even flirted with doing this and actually pulled it off with the Stardust and Goldust match in, I believe it was, what, 2016, 2015? I think the by that point, it just seemed like they'd done irreparable damage to what Cody could become. He stuck around in the Stardust gimmick too long. So, you know, a lot of things had to happen for us to get to this moment in 2019. 
Uh, mm. If it had happened in WWE, certainly doesn't look like this. Yeah, and I don't want this to be a, you know, shots at WWE podcast, but I think it's impossible to talk about this match without mentioning that this was something that both of these guys had wanted for so long. And I think it is, it's very interesting that they did meet beforehand, but as Stardust and Goldust, and even if they had met in the WWE, it would have been Cody earlier in that 2013, it would have been Cody Rhodes versus Goldust, not necessarily versus Dustin Rhodes. And of course totally they were very different. open with the fact they weren't hiding that who Dustin Rhodes was um, and that Goldust was Dustin Rhodes, Dusty Rhodes' son and Go- and Cody's brother. But it, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's interesting to think of the difference that that makes versus, you know, when we get this match, which is Cody Rhodes versus Dustin Rhodes, even though Dustin still paints his face, it's a very different setting and setup for it. So I think this match benefits a lot from being the fact that this is like, this is really the first meeting of these brothers. Uh, But of course we didn't know when AEW started, we didn't know that Dustin was going to be part of this. Uh, And part of the intrigue of this match was when double or nothing was announced, Cody didn't have an opponent. And I was sort of teasing who it might be on BTE uh, without saying who it was. Uh, Cody seemed very set on this mystery opponent, but Brandy Rhodes really didn't want it to happen. Um, She was questioning the fact that he wanted to have this match and she sort of felt like she didn't, she wasn't in that. She didn't think it would be a good thing for him to go down this road. Uh, But the opponent was eventually revealed to be Dustin Rhodes uh, and the two of them engaged in, you know, a really heated set of interviews talking about the resentment that had built up between them Dustin feeling like their father had given had favored Cody, uh, given him sort of a golden upbringing, whereas he had been somewhat neglected as his father was more on the road at that point. And Cody feeling like he had never been properly acknowledged by his brother for the groundbreaking things that he was doing. He'd never actually got the support that he felt like he needed in this new venture. Uh, And also Cody felt like he represented an era of wrestlers that had been held down by the era that Dustin was very much a part of. And in his mind, beating Dustin and and killing, ending Dustin's career, as it was alluded to here, would, would bring to close wrestling's obsession with the Attitude Era. Chad, there's a lot going on in the build up to this match. Firstly, were you pumped when you found out we were getting Cody versus Dustin? Because I know it wasn't necessarily something that everyone was super psyched about when it was first announced. And secondly, what did you think about all of the different emotions and storylines and drama that we had going through the build up to this match? Well, my initial, my initial reaction certainly wasn't positive. I had a belief in what Cody was capable of doing, uh, a belief that had begun all the way back in 2009, and it was a pleasure to see him rise up through the ranks outside of WWE and really showcase some of the main event potential that he had, the potential as a character, the potential on the microphone. Um, There was was more that I had wanted for him for this show initially than I thought Dustin Rhodes could provide. The brother versus brother dynamic certainly was interesting, but, you know, I wanted to see a main event program from Cody Rhodes and I didn't feel like initially that that uh, that Dustin was in a position to to really hold up his end of the bargain for that something he would go on to prove me very much wrong about uh, as did the rest of this feud so as they started getting it going and started doing the interviews particularly Cody Cody stepped into that main event level spotlight I thought and really put to rest any of the doubts that anybody in my mind should have had about whether or not he could carry his end of a top level program and be the face of a brand caliber star by the end of those road to double or nothing interviews that he'd done. Uh, and certainly that's, it's a, there's a great reminder of that in the hype video that they show right before this match that Mm. does a great job of setting the stage for, um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts here, but if done correctly, this, this is could end up being the, the heart and the soul of this show. And as that show progressed, you realize that's going to be a special thing if they can figure if they can pull that off. The 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 various elements create this intangible quality to this match that when you compare it to others, it's really hard to to not get excited about the 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 historical value of a match like Cody versus Dustin because you do have the era versus era, you do have mm-hmm. the brother versus brother, you do have this carryover 
from WWE, you've got this AEW versus WWE element to it that they're trying to stick it to WWE. They're thumbing their Mm. nose at the opportunities they never got there. There's a lot to like about this match as you go into it. By the time you get to the fact that these guys are coming out for their entrances, there's already a lot of different emotions peaking Mm. and setting the stage for this to be uh, for this to be one of those scenarios where mm-hmm. by the time the bell rings, all they got to do is is put the finishing stamp on it. All the elements are there. Everybody's buzzed. They've done a good job of winning over people like me who were doubtful mm-hmm. from the announcement of the match. So a lot of good things ro- working for it by the time we even get to the bell ringing. Yeah, I was skeptical when I they were first throwing names around and Dustin Rhodes was one of the people they were thinking. And I was like, man, this this guy hasn't wrestled for a year. And last time he was wrestling, he was doing this comedy bits with our truth. And, and this is the guy who is at that point, he was the figurehead of the company more than anyone else. At this point, TK had never appeared on screen, even though Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho were in this quasi main event feud. Cody was the one that was doing the media. He was the one that was sort of emceeing these press conferences that they were having. <clears throat> This is the guy that's the face of this new company, and he's wrestling a guy who he had history with, of course, and there was these, you know, there was this match that they wanted to have, but I didn't think it was someone who was ready for that, or, well, no, I mean, not ready, but should be positioned against the face of the company. Uh, but I was, I was also, yeah, I was also won over by the rawness of how Dustin Rhodes was presented even in his just initial interviews when he was when he was announced the first thing they did they had these drone shots going up the road and you had Dustin Rhodes with no face paint on looking old but talking with a fire and talking with passion and talking like he had something that he really wanted to prove and I was I was on board from that point and as I said it built up with so much drama and so many things that I really engaged with like the idea of this obsession with the attitude era dying off that was something that i was wanting to happen like you and i both we wrote and we talked about like this obsession has to end and they are speaking it into fruition like they are saying the words that we had written giving a voice on a massive scale to the things that we'd been talking about so i certainly engage with that and i thought it was interesting before we do get into the match because of course we we must do that uh, i thought it was interesting that they were talking about this like it was going to be dustin rhodes's last match like the promos were like this guy's having his last one he's you know we're ready to take old yeller out the back and shoot him (laughs) and even even in the like the little promo video they have before the match dustin says himself this isn't a new beginning um like you know this is going to be the end of something for dustin rhodes uh and it's crazy now you know three years down the line the bloke's still wrestling and is in as good a shape as he's ever been (laughs) Uh, you know, really crazy that that was an element that was in it. Uh, I'd forgotten about that part of it, but I, I thought that was really funny to to see now after like knowing what we know now about how his career sort of relaunched at this point. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So look, getting into the the match itself, we had, of course, that that promo that sums up what we've been talking about, the video package that sums up all of that uh, in a, you know, a really nice way. Really cool song uh, playing in the background. Cody is the first to come out, of course. Huge entrance, lights down, choral music to reveal a throne with a very Triple H-esque cross on it. And then the line comes through, wrestling has more than one royal family. Cody comes out the heel tunnel, interestingly, walks down to the ring. Brandy gets a sledgehammer out gives it to Cody who walks back up the ramp and breaks the throne with uh, fireworks going off as he lands the sledge, or just as he lands the the sledgehammer into the throne. Uh, This was incredibly divisive at the time. Doc, what did, what did you think of it? Well, as someone who, as you alluded to, as someone who right there with you was really beating the drum that WWE had to stop the nostalgia obsession Mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved it on multiple levels because I immediately thought of, and I was thinking about this when rewatching it, I immediately thought of the interview that, or I guess maybe the, the Twitter post that Cody put out when he uh, when he left WWE in 2016. 
and it was directed at something Triple H had said about, you know, sometimes quarterbacks just have to wait their turn. And then Cody fired back with this passionate speech about not wanting if you if you feel like you can be the number one guy, you don't want to sit the sidelines. And if you need mm-hmm. to, you're going to go somewhere where you get the chance. And so that would that call back to that Triple H uh, exchange on on social media shortly after he was released. Uh, that struck a chord and the whole thing struck the right chord for any of us who had felt so estranged by WWE's booking pattern for the several previous years. So I loved it. It, it gave me I've often called Cody, at least back then and, and up until maybe last year, I called him the heart and soul of AEW. And it sort mm-hmm. of felt like he was in, he was taking on the mantle of this yeah. is a competition. This is about creating an alternative. This is about what we weren't able to do. And this is about an era that needs to finally die. Mm. Uh, I loved it. I ate it up like yeah. crazy. Even beyond that idea of like the previous era and all of, all of that, that sort of the, almost a meta commentary that that's having. I, I do also love the symbolism of this, of Cody reclaiming the heritage of his family you know, as as I said, the line at the start of his song is wrestling has more than one royal family. Wrestling should be more than the WWE. And for 20 years, it it is pretty much at a, on a mainstream level. Wrestling has been the WWE. Like what when you or I tell someone we like wrestling, what are they, oh, the, like the WWE? And mm-hmm. yeah, like the WWE, because it's just synonymous with it. And yet the history of wrestling is not that. That is relatively new occurrence, and Cody is almost reclaiming his family's heritage. Uh, you know, and like the lyrics to his song, they took it all away, they took it all away, but they can't take my freedom. This is a guy who is not just motivated by all those other things we talked about, but just his own family's pride and the heritage of it, and he's just about to go out with his brother uh, and have this match. I like right now I'm getting goosebumps talking about that aspect of it, which I think is really evocative and really emotive. And we can dwell all we like about like are these shots, is it good or not? But like this is emotional engagement, which is what wrestling should be. And and even before these two lock up, we are both like just passionately ranting and raving about all of the things that this match means. Did you have just anything more to say about Cody's entrance before we get to the the match itself? One more thing. This is just a quick shout out to Justin Roberts or whoever told Justin Roberts to do this. But I loved it on that night because I was, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was curious, you know, how are they going to get across that it's Cody Rhodes? And so they do Cody with Brandy. Rhodes! Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I thought you know, if this match yep. has so many intangible qualities to it that if I was sitting mm-hmm. down with a pen and a pad, I'd be like, there's one for uh, there's one for the throne. There's one for Justin Roberts. You know, before yeah. we even get started, you've got plenty in the tank yep. of the the promo video. It's got a lot going for it before the bell even rings. Yeah, and of course, I mean that even that just it fits into that narrative I was talking about. Like, what what have they taken away? They've even taken away this man's name. Brandy was able to trademark her name, so she somehow claimed it. But Cody, for the long for a long time, wasn't able to use that last name. But you know what? It doesn't matter because everyone knows the history, even if it isn't even if it isn't legally able to be spoken. Uh, okay, let's let's get into the match. Dustin comes out, of course, big cheers. Comes out in red and black. I, I love the look. I love the half painted as well, sort of revealing like a bit more of himself than before, but also maintaining like a link to the past, which we all loved him as Gold Dust. Like it's not. Yeah, we're not. We love the the reason we are so passionate about wrestling is largely because of the WWE. So we're definitely not trying to get rid of that. Um, of course, before these two even lock up, the the crowd is chanting for Dusty. Alex Marvez, you know, he wasn't a great commentator, but in he had his moments and he sets the tone perfectly by saying, "I don't know how Dusty would feel about what's about to happen." Really great line from Marvez there. Uh, you know, after initial hesitancy uh, in, in these two, they didn't necessarily want to engage. Maybe speaking of like both of them are carrying a lot of emotional baggage and and maybe they don't actually want to air it all out in public and, and get into this. There's like hesitancy. Um, but once they get into it, Cody has huge advantage. Um, and if anything, he's acting in contempt of his older brother, doing cartwheels, pulling faces, taunting him. Uh, and dropping him a number of times without, you know, seemingly having to try a whole lot. 
Dustin, though, is able to fight back in by showing off some new moves, including a sent off, sent on off the apron, uh, and also even like a little extra step of speed that he didn't have, you know, the last time we may have seen him, showing that he is actually in quite good shape compared to where we thought he was at going into it. Doc, before we get into the big moment of this match, and I think everyone knows what I'm referencing there, um, early on, what did you think of their exchanges? There's so many different character dynamics that could have shaped the the way that this match was formatted. I, I kind of liked the the little bit of arrogance we saw from Cody, mm. uh, especially early on, because you've got so much emotion running with the, with everybody chanting for Dusty. I love, personally, I love it when you've got a bunch of different elements in one match when you see the pre-match emotions from both guys hearing the crowd chanting for their dad giving themselves that moment to let that breathe to not push that away to acknowledge it and to go in that direction and then and then you know kind of set the tone for the match with Cody establishing himself as okay Dusty's Dustin's going to be the sympathetic figure Cody's going to assume the role of the of the cocky younger brother who's got something to prove and already thinks that there's really no reason why this older guy should be in the ring with him anymore. Um, I liked all of that. Uh, the early exchanges I thought set the character tones well. Yeah, you've got some. You got some. You, you can you can take it either way, and I love that about it too. And you know, in AEW as a fan base, we embrace whatever the heck we want to embrace. We're not told to think mm. a certain way. We can just be however we want, feel however we feel. This match takes you in a bunch of different directions, pre-match, post-match. I thought they did well in the early exchanges for sure. Mm. Yep, absolutely. It is a bit of a dynamic they're setting up where Cody is is kind of contemptuous, which, you know, you would say that's like typically the heels position in a match. But at the same time, it, it fits that story we we're talking about with how he wants to kill the previous generation because he doesn't think it's worth anything anymore. You know, he's showing that physically here by just beating up his brother without breaking a sweat uh, and beating up the symbol, like the symbol of the older generation uh, without breaking a sweat. Now, of course, if this match is known for anything, it is known for this incredible, <laughs> insane blade job that Dustin does and bleed, busting, busting himself off it open and just bleeding everywhere. Um, it happens, of course, as he charges the turnbuckle. Cody gets out of the way just at the right moment after he's pulled the, the turnbuckle pad off. Dustin rolls to the outside only to get hit with a spear by Brandy. Earl Hebner, the referee, sorry, I forgot to mention before, Earl Hebner is refing the match. Uh, Earl Hebner throws out Brandy. She doesn't want to go, but DDP comes out and picks her up and puts her on his shoulder and walks her down the walks her down the ramp. And in the midst of all of that, Bla Dustin jumps under the ring and cuts himself an absolute gusher. A great line by JR during all of this as all of this chaos is going on. Uh, what kind of a family is this for for God's sakes? Great line. <laughs> uh, and yeah, when when Dustin comes up. Uh, outside of the ring and it's shown that he's bleeding there's a visceral reaction in the arena people in the front row are like leaning away from it. there's a girl who's kind of like what the heck is going on cody for his part he dips his fingers in the blood and wipes it across his chest across his dream tattoo doc we've seen blood as like a fairly regular occurrence in AEW. it's it's easy to forget just how shocking this particular it was when it happened why did this feel so transgressive well i think by by that point most of us have been conditioned not to expect such uh gory nature of a wrestling match anymore it was an old school tactic that a lot of people were happy to see phased out uh, i was always a proponent of its value i think that the visceral the visceral reaction it got was twofold. Number one, it was because I I, I don't know I I can't speak to the demographics of the audience and attendance in Las Vegas that night, but I would assume that like me that uh, outside of seeking something from a, a promotion that didn't get a whole lot of actual time and in, in, in the mainstream, the opportunity to see that kind of a gusher is had it had been long it'd been a, it'd been a bygone era since we'd seen it, and there was that plus. It was a lot. <laughs> it yeah, was a, it, was, it was a lot of blood. I had not. I personally, I was trying to think of a of a reaction to a blade job that palpable from mm. an audience. And the only one I can really think of that was on that level 
maybe even to a greater extent, if we broke it down, would have been the Eddie Guerrero versus JBL match mm-hmm. in Judgment Day 2004. But I mean, it, it, I thought immediately this this is adding something to this story this mm-hmm. this is taking it in in a direction where these guys are going to have an opportunity to to tell a special story this is not just mm-hmm. going to be uh this is not just going to be an exhibition match this is not going to be bret hart versus owen hart at wrestlemania 10 you know this is going to be a, a personal war that's going to live mm-hmm. up to the billing of what we expect it's going to be overbooked it's going to be crazy you know let's get mm-hmm. to it because that when you get to that level of blood then the the tone of the the tone shifts and your expectations oh, change. Yeah, it, the tone shifts is right. Like you can feel it in the air. As I said, there's like this reaction in the crowd as people see it come up on the on the screens, where the crowd's just going, oh goodness, like what is this? And you know, there's shots where like it's not just a you know a nick across the forehead and a little bit of red and and then it sort of halts. Like, there's shots during the match where it's literally, like, pouring out of his forehead and pooling on the canvas. It's yeah. getting everywhere, over everything. And, and and as you said, like, it is setting the tone. As you, you know, you said it still has its worth. And, like, this match shows that in spades, how it can change the tone uh, and can change the feel of a match in an instant when it's used well. And also, I think, as you said, part of it is we haven't seen it. And for it to come out so spectacularly like in such a dramatic way was it was really something and it it really adds a lot to this match uh, and they play into that so well um you know as we get on with the fight Dustin he's affected by the blood loss he isn't able to see properly and, and like there's things where he's swinging at the air and Cody's really taking over just like methodically punishing his older brother and the magic of the blood like really comes to the fore when we see Dustin start to fire up and come back. Uh, it just feels so much more monumental uh, because like you're seeing him suffer, seeing him like the life drain from him. And when he gets that fire up and gets that grit, it, it just feels so much more intense because of it. You know, there's like this incredible figure four exchange and, you can like see the look on Dustin's face when he, he Cody puts it on Dustin and Co, Dustin's in so much pain, but then he turns it over and he's still in like agony, but he's just fighting through it and gritting through it because he just wants to try and get the win um, because he is coming into this wanting to prove that he still has something to offer. Uh, and he is just going to, pr- he's going to fight through all of this adversity that he's and, and fight through everything that's in front of him to, to, to try and win. You know, he takes Cody's belt off and spanks him. Uh, He hits a code red and the crowd just goes absolutely mental. Uh, And then after the code red, he hits a crossroads and gets a really close 2-4. And it feels like the crowd at that point is so on his side. They want him to win. And, like, you believe that he can win because his fire up is so monumental and has so much heart and so much grit. Indeed it does. Indeed it does. I think the I think one of the things that blood does, and I'll subscribe to the Bret Hart theory on this. I remember specifically something he mentioned in his book about his match with Davy Boy Smith in December of 1995. They had a feud that people were interested because there had been some history there, but the people were not, you know, fully locked into this being a WWF title feud. Bret Hart blades in that match. It completely changes the tone and makes it feel like an epic main event. I feel like this match had that going for it as well. It added an an additional layer to emotional drama, uh, a a resonance on a deeper layer that wouldn't have been there without it. I don't think this match is what is, is remembered the same way. If you take that element out, it really kind of took it to a level that uh, suddenly made it very clear. This is not a, you know, this is not just a a middle of the card kind of story. Uh, this yeah. isn't going to be even Nick Aldis versus Cody Rhodes, a 15 minute affair overbooked from from all in. This is going to be this is going to be everything that it could possibly be. It's going to be optimized. It's going to be personal. It's going to be dramatic. And it certainly was in every phase of it from that point forward, deep into the d- the depths of the match. When you start getting to that level that allows performances like that to achieve such labels as five star. Chad, you've seen a lot more wrestling than I have. You're like a, a true wrestling historian as far as I'm concerned. Have you ever seen – like, had you ever seen 
a fire up from Dustin Rhodes remotely in the in the same the same window as this one. No, and, and again, I think part of that goes down to comes back to you know a bleeding at that level is largely a main event type thing, and Dustin Rhodes was never a main event type wrestler. That was it, it, for him to get that kind of trope added into this performance. Really, I mean. It puts him on a level that he'd never been before. It offered to Cody Rhodes a great opportunity to step into a main event spotlight, but it often it offered Dustin Rhodes one he'd never had before in a 30 plus year career mm. uh, as great as he was in the era he came from. And as much as he offered in the mid card role, he was never this kind of guy. This gave the, the, the fire up there was told well throughout that story this is not someone that's going to be put out to pasture this is someone that's going to fight like hell to earn the respect that he feels like he's lacking from his little brother and he's going to get he's going to get out of this as much as anybody and man the crowd is just so on his side i said like before there was that visceral reaction they sort of get over that and get behind dustin with like such a force and such a fury and such passion and this is, remember, this is against the guy who has been like the face of this company that all these people believe in and want to love so much. And yet they're, they're like cheering for him to get beaten uh, in this match. That's how like incredibly sympathetic and how powerful this this performance is from Dustin Rhodes. Uh, and of course, the blood is a huge part of that, but just the way that he grits through it uh, and, and the way that he pulls out new moves as well as like the surprise the way that he sells, I guess, when it when Cody takes over and Cody is beating him, it, it all just adds up to such a phenomenal performance from Dustin here. Dustin, of course, gets that fire up, gets that really close two count, but isn't able to win because ultimately Cody is the younger and he is the, the more athletic and he is the more seasoned wrestler at that point, gets back into the match with a low blow. It's a disaster kick. Crossroads for only two and then... If that ended the match at that point, it would have been incredible. But the next final stanza after that, that cr- the crossroads by Cody, it's proper main event, incredibly emotional stuff. There's just so many shots of them, like just caked in, in Dustin's blood. Both of them have got it all over them. There's, you know, them sort of rising together. There's, Dustin hits another crossroads on Cody, isn't able to get the win, but he's almost like cradling Cody afterwards because after all, like this is his baby brother. And like suddenly they're realizing what they're putting one another through. They trade strikes. They like try and hit a Spanish fly, but because Dustin's got so much blood on him, they sort of slip out and just like fly off, which I mean, like it's a botch, but I love it because it's so realistic. And sometimes like a botch like that actually is better than if they pulled off the moves. Cody finally gets Dustin up, hits the Din's fire, the vertebraker, and then a final crossroads to get the win. Doc, before we get into the the post match, which is also like all of emotion, all level all levels of emotion and 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 passion, what did you think of this final stanza that we're talking about here? It is the type of thing that that lends a match the kind of credentials necessary to earn that fifth star, so to speak. Uh, I know not everybody gives a crap about star ratings, but you can tell there's a different layer of performance level you have to hit, an additional added layer of emotional drama that has to be hit in order for you to get that kind of that that kind of praise from an audience from from wrestling critics, of which there are more now than ever. <laughs> uh, it is it's it's a lot of things. You know, it's emotional Uh, as a wrestling critic. You you can kind of watch it in real time, remembering the moment you sat there and and, and thought, God, Meltzer is going to get is going to give this five stars. Everyone's going to remember this match forever. This is going to go down. Three star general is going to be getting five of the big ones. (laughs) (laughs) This is going to be this is going to go down as the as the as the heart and soul of the show. It could become the heart and soul of this promotion. This is what people are going to remember. Uh, this isn't just uh, it's it's the type of thing that takes it well beyond at that stage uh, when you get to that level. And, and it doesn't happen often. It happens now more than maybe it did back in the day, because I think people are more cognizant of trying to achieve that level of critical achievement. But it's one of those things, Sam, where you can you can just kind of feel that this isn't a wrestling match anymore. This is mm. an experience. Yeah. You know, this is this is more than just. Uh, than just a bunch of moves and some crazy spots and 
a crowd mm. chanting, this is awesome. Like, this is something more. This is something that uh, that with all the intangible qualities we'd already talked about, by the time we hit the climax of this match, by the time Cody picks him up for that final crossroads and you know it's about to be over, it's it's truly been a cathartic experience all the way around. It's been great for the, the sort of the redemption of the career of Cody. It's been a great for the main event elevation that we finally showed that Dustin was capable of hitting. We're all thrilled about just what this match could potentially mean. It's, it's a, it's a wonderful experience more than a wrestling match by the time that final bell rings. Yeah. And that, that atmosphere you're talking about and that feel in the air is, is just so palpable. There's like so many shots to the crowd where people have got like their hands clasped over their mouth just in disbelief and and just like completely living in the moment and, and being so wrapped up and so invested in the match, not even necessarily thinking all those things in real time, but being so like emotionally engaged in the match and so moved by it. Uh, and it's just written across the face of all the crowds. I remember watching this match and being like on the verge of tears, thinking about like what it means for these two performers and, uh, it's just an electric moment and and to give them their due as well. JR is, and the commentary team is incredible throughout this match. JR in particular talking about how he knows both men, how he knew them as children, how they shouldn't be fighting because they're brothers. It just lends so much emotion and gravitas to it. As we've talked about, there's just blood everywhere. And, and yeah, that final, the final stanza of the match, like that is the, the cherry, well, we're probably going to get to the cherry on top, but that's like the creme de la creme. There's so much emotional pathos going in into it and, and such a release as well, uh, such an emotional release of, of seeing these two men achieve what they're achieving. The story of them, like remembering how much they love each other, going from having such animosity early on to like in the final bit, Dustin cradling his brother and then we're going to get to it now this post match where like Cody leaves the ring but comes back in beautiful like really subtle moment but something that stuck with me to this day Cody comes back in and Dustin like cowers off into the side of the ring because he doesn't know what to expect is is Cody about to like beat him down again he's like cowering away in the corner Cody takes the mic tells Dustin he's it's he doesn't get to retire yet says that he signed himself for a match with the Young Bucks, the guys he thinks are the best tag team in the world, and says that line. But Dustin, I don't need a partner. I don't need a friend. I need my older brother. And the two embrace in the middle of the ring. And on the way out, Cody opens the ropes for Dustin, that respect gained back, and they come out walking up the ramp, brothers in arms, covered in blood together. It does not get... Much better than this when it comes to wrestling, Chad. I'm getting like goosebumps talking about it right now. I'm getting choked up. What a post match. Not many matches have that. You know, I mean you you can you can sit back and say that, you know, what happens bell to bell is really what we ought to be talking about, but you take in these pre match and post match dynamics. They're part of the fabric that create the experience and the memory of a product like this. And I mean, there are not many matches on on the level of this one when it comes to post match emotion, genuine emotion mm-hmm. pouring out of Cody Rhodes, the realization perhaps of what they had just achieved, weighing on his mind, coming out in the form of tears, perhaps not just for show and not just for the the the, the moment of being able to have accomplished what he did with his brother, um, just so much swept up, and we're all swept mm-hmm. up in it. It's just a yep. A one long 30, 40 minute cathartic experience. And I mean, post-match angles, the only the only one that really comes immediately to mind that stands out that's uh, anywhere close to this is the old Bacho King versus Warrior yeah. match from WrestleMania yep. 7 with Miss Elizabeth. I've written that down, actually. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. So. so watching this back, I was watching, taking my notes caught up in it after it finished i was like just finalizing my notes and cuss the commentary team and I, I was like listening to i looked up and excalibur's having to fix his mask because he's trying to wipe tears away under his mask like this is a guy that's seen it all literally like he's called so many matches yet he too is just so caught up into it in the moment and he's crying and like a match could not get a higher compliment than that than you know a guy who has seen it all 
getting so caught up that he's he's crying. And I think J- JR even like references the fact that there's not a dry eye in the house as well. Moving beyond the match, like obviously we both love this match. We've just spent half an hour raving about it, absolutely raving about it. Uh, and I want to ask like some questions about this that we're going to talk about it a little bit more analytically, I guess. The first one, has this match stood the test of time? What do you think, Chad? I think that the the emotional experience of it is, is, is that was my concern. You know, that the second book that I wrote really broke down at being able to be rewatchable as a fundamental mm. big piece of the puzzle to creating a ranking system yep. that allows you to contextualize this stuff. And I think that I've rewatched it twice. The, the the last one being in preparation for this podcast. And the first time that I rewatched it, I'll admit, I mean, if you want to get analytically nitpicky, it's not perfect. You know, there are moments mm-hmm. in it that are technically flawed, but that's not what this match is about. This match mm-hmm. is about, uh, this match is about emotion. This match is a different kind of pro wrestling experience than AEW largely hangs its hat on. And, mm-hmm. For that, I think it is incredibly memorable, and it does stand the test of time. It stands mm. the test of time for the message it sent on the night that it happened. It stands the test of time as being a quintessential example of what AEW as a movement was supposed to be and has been. Uh, it's a wonderful example of what both of these guys bring to the equation as pro wrestlers, Cody in particular from all of the intangible qualities, Dustin, the bell to bell stuff. He kind of owned the moment, uh, mm. but it, it, it's just, uh, I mean, overall it's, I, I think definitely it is, it is something that stood the test of time, especially that second rewatch did allow me to get back into that place where AEW was just this fresh infant thing. We didn't know mm. anything about, and this embodied the movement. Yeah. I think rewatching it for this podcast, it had been, well over a year since I'd revisited this match. Uh, So I was really able to get swept up in it again uh, in a way that I hadn't for when I did the rewatch, you know, maybe like three or four weeks afterwards just to sort of go back and and relive it a little bit, really was able to get swept up in it. And I think a beautiful thing that this match did was it really set a tone for AEW uh, and it, it brought something very different that we hadn't seen in wrestling for a long time. And it showed it, it displayed it. And a lot of what AEW was doing early on was sort of setting expectations and saying, like, these are the sorts of things you can expect in AEW. And and this was a fantastic flag pop for them to, like, raise up at their first ever event and just say, we are going to tell unabashedly uncynical emotional tales, just things that are very earnest and we want our audience to get completely swept up in it, in the emotion of it and, and completely wrapped up in the storyline, just the, the pure story we're telling. Uh, and we're going to pay that off and we're going to, to do it in a spectacular way. And this match really showed that and set a tone for that and, and showed demonstrated a wrestling. And, and also another thing, we're going to show wrestling that you haven't seen. If you are a younger fan, like, Say, for instance, myself, um, I came to wrestling in the late 2000s, uh, so I hadn't really experienced in real time a match like this. I'd gone back and seen a few things, but it's different living it in real time than it is going back and rewatching from a historical perspective, I think. And and that's not just – and I agree that matches should be rewatchable. The best matches should be rewatchable. Um, but it is different, I think, living a match like this in real time than rewatching it. You sort of talked about like where this ranks for each match. And one thing that was interesting that got brought up in the very first episode that I did uh, of this podcast with Ms. Fan, we talked about Cody Rhodes versus Chris Jericho, which is the other like really high profile match Cody had that year. And he said that while he loves this match and thinks it's amazing, that that match is actually the definitive Cody Rhodes performance and the greatest performance of Cody Rhodes' career. What what do you think of that that analysis of the performance, Chad? Uh, on a certain level, I can appreciate what he's saying. I think that there's some key similarities to, to to both performances from Cody. Obviously, 
uh, with the probably the biggest difference is that Cody is not playing the protagonist in this story, but he mm. was in that one. I think that to me, you could you can make the argument that that Dustin was really the the focal point of this match. Uh, maybe that's true. I mean, we talked a lot about how the emotional high points, a lot of them came from what uh, what Dustin did. But, you know, to me, I don't know. I mean, to, to be honest with you, Sam, I think that what makes this the most memorable Cody performance uh, speaks to the intangibles that work toward the success of the performance. I, I, if I may, can I, I, I want to tell you a little personal story about Cody that made this match so special to me. And perhaps others can relate. I go back to my time writing for what's now WrestlingHeadlines.com. And I wrote this series of short stories in 2011 and 2012 leading into uh, WrestleMania in 2013. And it was all just me with a pen writing these futuristic, basically writing like a, a, a really like a beat writer sports report of what had happened in my mind and 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 in 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 my storylines that i wrote that year cody rhodes was the guy i picked to be in the main event of wrestlemania i believed in cody rhodes i believed in his potential and i believed in what he could do i positioned him straight out of that maniacal character that he developed in 2011 into 2012 uh going from dashing into broken and i loved that maniacal Cody Rhodes to the point where I positioned him. I wrote a, a series of stories where CM Punk was like the Batman of WWE. And I made Cody Rhodes quietly across a year long period, the Joker who rose up and finally was the one who watched the world burn. So to speak, I believed in Cody Rhodes as a main event guy. And so to me, this performance against Dustin as great of a Dustin performance as it is, everything about it is built by, what Cody brought to the table, what Cody emotionally brought to the table. Dustin merely played off of that. Cody is the man in this match, and Cody is the man in AEW coming out of this match, regardless of who was positioned to go after the AEW championship. The attitude, the way he carried himself, the entrance, all of the intangible qualities we talked about. Cody Rhodes came out of Double or Nothing 2019 as no question about it. This is the guy for this company. This is the guy who everyone's talking about. And to me, as good as he was in that match against Chris Jericho at full gear later that year. Quite which frankly, is a match I, that you love. That it I know is. you it's, love it's, as well. It's old like, you're not speaking NWA ill of that match. It's circa the it's, 1980s. It's a yeah. Ric Flair versus Dusty Rhodes match. Come back to life to show us that what's old is still working here in the new school. It's 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 great. But as great as it is, all due respect to Miz fan, as great as that match is, it's not Cody versus Dustin. It's not the visceral experience that is Cody Rhodes versus Dustin. And in a world in which a great wrestling match is a dime a dozen i mean we could see four great wrestling matches from aew in the span of a month in this day and age but mm. this match is the experience this match is all of those things that make wrestling wonderful in addition to just what happens I, there was I, I was listening to a biz fan comment and the, my, my comment that i made out loud in response to it is the secret to wrestling is it's not really about wrestling. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. What happens, the, the moves are not what matters. It, the moves are great. I love moves. Give me a young bucks match any day of the week in this day and age. And I'll love it. Give me the Kenny Omega, Kazuchika Okada stuff. I love it all, but there's something different about a match that doesn't win you over based on the kind of moves that are, that are there, but on the, uh, the, the 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 strength of the characters and the story being told. You know what's funny? Ms. Fan obviously isn't here to to talk for himself, but I think he'd probably agree with you. Honestly, in in that state, he'd agree with that statement. I think the the thing, the strength of that performance is that is Cody at his peak as a face. I think probably the zenith of his character almost in AEW is that that particular performance. This was what definitely put him on track for that sort of thing, particularly like the 
the emotion and heart that he displays in the post match. But I do understand how his performance is not necessarily it all works, right? Like we're we're absolutely we could not be splitting hairs more finely. It, it all works, but he his performance is a little bit where he is the badass throne breaker early on, contentious of his brother, and then he's the getting his butt spanked <laughs> with his belt. There's a little bit of dissonance in that, and I, I do understand that. Whereas the Jericho match. He is all heart, all grit, all fire. I guess he is the one that's gritting and, and fighting through the blood as Dustin is in this match. I, I don't know where I stand, honestly, having rewatched this one now. They are both just incredible performances. I, and I, But I do agree that like the zenith of Cody's character is that Jericho match. I, I will say what the the one last thing I'd say about the comparison of those mm. two performances is just this. Um, there's a lot of great things to love about that Cody and Jericho match. There really are. As as you guys aptly put it, there's there's a lot of reasons why it's an underrated classic in AEW mm. that deserves a rewatch from anybody who maybe was a little down on it at first. It is a great example of how to bring old school qualities to a new school era. Mm. However, I think that there are ever for every reason we've talked about, there's a reason why when people talk about lists of AEW lore, that's the forgotten classic and Cody versus Dustin is the one everybody remembers. Mm. There's, it just, it left a more indelible mark. It's tough to deny that. Yeah. And as we can analytically analyze the performances, it's as much about the magic that was in the air. The fact that this was the first pay-per-view they ever had. The fact that this was like the performance that they could have had but didn't and as much as like this was something we hadn't seen whereas when we get to the jericho cody match we'd seen someone have an absolute gusher and fight through it with like all the grit and determination of of dusty roads in the 80s we'd seen that in this match from dustin so as you said there's a reason that this is a special match and it's as much about the magic that was in the air because of all of the other things going on around the match but that is part of wrestling, right? Like that is, there's nothing you can do. One of the the special things about like WrestleMania from the WWE is for the longest time, like that had that magic in the air. And that's what inspired you to write those books about the sure WrestleMania did. era. Like it, it, there was an undeniable magic in the air. Uh, and, and that was in the air during this match as well. I think just closing, we've alluded to it. Like this is by far the greatest match Dustin's ever had. There's no, no one's I think is going to argue about that. There's no bones about that. Incredible performance from him. So much heart, so much fire. Um, did you have anything you'd like to say about Dustin's performance before we sort of wrap this up as we hit the hour mark? Oh, hats off, hats off to Dustin for what he yep. accomplished that night. You know, it was. You know, I think it, it, he's kind of been living off the reputation of that match ever since. He's done some good stuff, but he's I mean, he'll never approach anything like this again. It was the story that was dying to be told, that he was dying to tell, and he told mm. it incredibly well and deserves all of the recognition that comes with He nearly died to awesome tell it as well with the amount of blood he lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. Uh, look. Sick. I mean, yeah. Like throat, you know. yeah you're a doctor so like you probably know how faint he was feeling at the back at the end of this match so Dude. so that's it that doc thing is a shoot um okay shoot look it, I, I i think we've covered just about everything from this match a moment in time absolutely magical watching a match like this live is like that is why we love wrestling Rewatching it even like it's just a reminder of just how good how good AEW can be when it gets it right, how good Cody is and, and just how much you can emotionally invest and how much, how rewarding it can be when you, when you do so. Uh, Doc, where did you rate it uh, before we, I, I've got, I got to know, where did you put it on your list when you were doing your organizing that, the, the top, the, the when I was the organizing the definitive match guide, this was my number yeah. one match. This was okay. Cool. Yep. Good. Yep. And yeah. when earlier this year, earlier 2021, we did a you, me, um, Rich Ladder and James, James Boyd, Boyd from yep. uh, One Nation Radio. We did a 
draft of matches and this was my number one pick uh, and it would have been no matter what <laughs> this is this is my favorite AEW even though I think like there's other matches that I've covered like Mox versus Brody that have got a real special place in my heart having rewatched this I I remember why that I've rated this number one what where would you put it Chad just uh from the matches that you've seen in AEW where would you put it and just to, to wrap things up oh man I, I'd, pr- I'd probably put it number two I, I still yep. have it tucked right behind uh, the match that I think is number one on this definitive guide. That was number guide. one, yep. The, yeah. the tag match. The tag yeah. match. The tag Hangman match. Man and Kenny versus the Young Bucks. And look, at some point, I will cover that, but as I said, we're spacing the big ones out. Well, hey, man, I appreciate being the being given the opportunity to talk about the number two. Yep, yep. Look, thank you for joining me, Chad. I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, it's been a while since you've engaged in wrestling media, so I, I love that you're you've come back onto this. I'd love to be the one that lights the fire back under your under your ass. <laughs> but I know I know there's lots going on for you as well. So you've got plenty on in your life. If if anyone wants to do you a favor, do themselves a favor even. Um, you can find Chad's books on Amazon. You did an audio book for one of them as well, didn't you? I did. Yeah, the the greatest matches and rivalries book has got the audio book. Yeah. Um, you know I. I appreciate everybody who continues to to purchase it because I still get I still get my <laughs> royalty checks every month. So I guess enough people haven't forgotten about it yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, if nothing else, you can make a buck off it. Anyway, look, as I said, thank you so much for joining me. This was a special podcast needed a special a special guest. Uh, and I'm really thankful that you were able to come on. And uh, it's cool to have my own podcast to invite you on to now as well after you inviting me onto your podcast so many times in the past. So, no, oh, yeah. man, it's been a great pleasure. I hope I can come back and do this again with you for something else at some point. Keep up the great work. It's been an awesome series so far. We needed it. It's time to uh-huh. start contextualizing AEW lore uh, in, a, in greater detail. So keep keep doing what you're doing. Fantastic. Thank you again for joining us. And next week, we're talking about another classic. If you want to talk to me um, and reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter, Sir underscore Samuel. I'd love to talk more about this match, of course, Uh, but you can find me there. And thank you for listening. and I'll see you again next week. Hi, guys. Sam here. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, This isn't something that I normally do. This is actually the first time I've ever talked about current events, really, on this podcast. Um, But given that we were talking about Cody Rhodes versus Dustin Rhodes this week, I thought it was appropriate to add something on the end here to talk about the massive news that came out this week that Cody Rhodes um, has finished negotiations with AEW. They they didn't manage to come to an agreement, uh, and he is now negotiating with other companies Uh, to see where he goes in his future. It's really shocking. To put it really simply, AEW would not have happened without Cody Rhodes. TK, of course, brought the money. uh, But as much as anyone, it was Cody's vision that brought AEW to life. Um, That bet with Meltzer, he was the one that took them up on that. Of course, it was him and the Young Bucks that put money on the line to make All In happen. Uh, And Cody, in the first... 6, 12 months of the promotion, he was the face of it. He was the heart and soul of AEW. His imprint is in that company, possibly more than anyone else's. Uh, It could not have happened, of course, without the Young Bucks. It could not have happened without Kenny Omega. Uh, And it could not have happened without Cody Rhodes. Those four men, the combination of them, is what allowed AEW to happen. And that's something that can never be taken away, right? But that's also one of the reasons it's so shocking that Cody Rhodes is leaving. This is a place that he believed in, that he loved. I have no doubt in my mind that when he talked about how much he loved AEW, how it was the Ellis Island for professional wrestling, that he meant it 100% genuinely. It was his child. And he's now walking away from it. And... That being said, even though it was his child and even though he was the face of it, it became clear really in the last 12 months that he was struggling to find his place in the card, especially since all of the new arrivals came this summer. You know, first Andrade, Malachi Black, and then the big ones. You had Punk, Danielson, 
Adam Cole. Last week, I tweeted out, and it was something that got a fair bit of traction, actually. Uh, I tweeted out words to the effect that AEW isn't, is no longer just the little train that could. Um, it's no longer like the rinky-dink promotion that is stacking its mid-card with acts like Luchasaurus uh, or Joey Janela or Jimmy Havoc. You know, some of those acts stuck around. Some of them are, not, are leaving now. Uh, it's a very different promotion now. And I, I feel like if the first era of AEW didn't come to an end when CM Punk debuted in Chicago last summer, it's definitely come to an end now with Cody Rhodes leaving. Um, This is a different promotion, a vastly different promotion. Um, And it's only going to move further away from the AEW that it was in 2019. It's still got a lot of the heart, a lot of the soul, a lot of the performers. Um, But it is a different promotion to the one that it was. Uh, And it's funny, I I invited Doc to be on this podcast, but, you know, we're we're both busy people. We couldn't make it work. We live across across the world from one another, so we just couldn't make it work. But after we talked about... Dustin versus Cody, uh, the recording had ended, and we're just talking about AEW. We're both enjoying it. He actually said it's a really different promotion now, and that was back in December. Uh, and that's only become more and more clear this year. And yeah, as I said, I think the first era of AEW is officially over now. Um, if it wasn't, if it didn't come to a close when Punk debuted or at All Out, uh, it definitely came to a close this week when Cody left. This isn't a current events podcast, though, and I very specifically made it not a current events podcast. I I think history is often best contextualised when you've got a bit more time to see what's happened on the way out. Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about is how him leaving affects the legacy of that match that he had with Dustin to kick off AEW, um, because this is a podcast that focuses on matches, and so much of this match is about Cody and the WWE and where he's come to with AEW. Be it being able to fight with his brother, be it being able to wrestle on a big-time pay-per-view main event platform, be it being able to bleed like like in the 80s. This match is defined by the things that Cody wanted to do but wasn't able to when he worked for the WWE. The reason he left the WWE was so he could do things like this. And that tone was set in that opening moment that we spoke about in the podcast where... He came out to the words, wrestling has more than one royal family, and he crushed the throne that he felt was oppressing him and was oppressing wrestling in general. There's been a meme that's going around uh, that's had Cody with superglue fixing the throne, saying that one of the first things he's going to have to do with the WWE is put together a put back together a throne and you know it is a pretty funny thing to think about i don't know how seriously people are when they're talking about that um but as a symbol it it is interesting how that symbol stacks up now and how it looks given that cody is going back to the throne he's going to have to kiss the ring of vince mcmahon again he's going to have to bend the knee when he's told to and i get how some people would say that means that this moment which was as we said so much of an emotional moment how that loses some of its power given that cody what cody is doing now but personally i i have to disagree with that he's going back to wwe a huge star far bigger than the guy who left he not only proved himself right and proved triple h and Vince mcmahon wrong but that throne that he broke is still broken Um, And the spirit that he embodied when he made that entrance is still alive and well in AEW. You know, be it Brian Danielson having bloody wars with with, uh, Hangman Page and being able to be just a a complete stone-cold badass. Be it CM Punk coming back. Be it John Moxley not having to do the things that he had to do in the WWE that compromised made him feel like he compromised the character that he was. Be it Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks being able to wrestle without having to mute themselves to fit the style that Vince McMahon feels that pro wrestling should be. You know, be it Keith Lee, who debuted last week, being able to wrestle without a shirt on. Like, that throne still lies broken. WWE is not going to be beaten by AEW it's far too big for that they're playing on different scales 
But AEW is going to continue to challenge the idea that Vince McMahon has for wrestling, that the only way that wrestling can ever be big and can ever be mainstream is by shedding itself of all of the trappings of wrestling. The smoky rooms, the blood, the grit, the... (laughs) Even, you know, the big fat man that did it. Because it was big fat man in the 80s sometimes. <laughs> and in the 90s. Uh, you know, big fat tough man. <laughs> that spirit is going to live on in AEW. AEW in a few years time is going to get a giant check from a TV company. Because they have been pulling in great TV numbers. They've been ranking in the top five consistently. They're going to get a great big check. They're only going to get bigger. They're not going to be on the same level as the WWE anytime soon. But they are going to be continuing to challenge Vince McMahon's ideology of pro wrestling. Um, And that is that pro wrestling doesn't sell. Sports entertainment is what needs to sell. And that is what this match is about. This match is pro wrestling. It is not sports entertainment. It is unabashedly, it is proudly pro wrestling. Uh, and you may be able to hear a storm in the background, which is interesting backing, considering what we're talking about. I'll move on now. I'll try and keep my thoughts on this as brief as possible, but I did also want to talk about what is the future for Cody Rhodes? Personally, now he's not in AEW. You know, he may come back to AEW. They may come to terms. Who knows? Um, but it seems like that, at least for the minute, is off the table. Personally, I'd love to see him go to the NWA. (laughs) Um, He would fit, like, as I said, he's had trouble in AEW fitting in the card, but it would be very clear if he went to the NWA who the top dog was. Jesus Christ, that was loud. And he would fit like a glove with what they are trying to do there and would also bring tremendous amounts of buzz. Um, And if it was an issue in AEW that was purely creative then it would make sense for him to go somewhere like the NWA. However, that's not what most reporters are saying, and there's lots of really good and genuine and rel- relatively reliable reporters who are saying a big issue in this is the money. Uh, and look, I will never begrudge someone trying to secure the future for their family, particularly in an industry that is as unreliable, as unpredictable as pro wrestling. Like Cody Rhodes could break his neck in the next match that he wrestles and never be able to wrestle again. That's a reality that he walks out to every day. And the minute that that happens, even though there's plenty of other things he could do, his worth plummets. His future potential earnings plummet. So pro wrestlers have to secure their future. And I will never begrudge them doing that. I'm a father, I work a full-time job, I know what it means to sacrifice things professionally to secure other parts of my life. Um, That's actually something that I know a lot about. Um, I haven't talked to many people about it, but it's something that I do know a lot about. And Cody Rhodes, he's going into the WWE, eyes open. He knows the landscape. He grew up in the landscape. He was a rookie in it, and he went to become you know the star that he was in 2016 um, and the person that he was in 2016 in the WWE he knows the people that he can trust he knows the people that he can't trust he knows what will be expected of him he is not going in in with a naive idea particularly given the way that NXT has been this year he's not going in with a naive naive idea that he is going to be able to wrestle the kind of matches that he wrestled with Dustin Rhodes in the WWE However, that said, I think the WWE will treat him extremely well. The WWE has a bad reputation and a bad history of treading all over the people that came across from its competition. The guys who came across from the WCW and ECW got treated atrociously for the most part. However, I don't think that's going to be the case at all this time. Cody Rhodes is going to be a test case. And the way he gets treated will send a message to the rest of the AEW locker room. Many of whom are very loyal to Cody and owe a lot to Cody. Uh, And it will play a big part in any future contract negotiations WWE has with guys like MJF. Guys like Ricky Starks, both really close friends with Cody Rhodes. Guys like Jungle Boy, you know, someone that they might want to develop at some point. 
or maybe returning guys like John Moxley, Brian Danielson, they might see that, oh, I ha- maybe I haven't burnt the bridge in the way that I thought I may have. You know, these are guys that WWE may want to have a look at in the future. Uh, there's lots of young guys in a- in AEW. There's lots of veterans in AEW who've got history in WWE. Uh, and the way that WWE treats Cody will send a message to all of those guys that the door is open if you want to come in. You know, the WWE is not going to change for Cody Rhodes, but it's also not going to tread on Cody Rhodes. And for me personally, look, I wish Cody all the best. Uh, I loved what Cody did in AEW. I love the company AEW. I've now given countless hours writing about AEW and podcasting about AEW. Uh, And as I said at the top, it would not have happened without Cody. It's hard to say who is the biggest driving force in what happened um, and what became AEW, but, you know... In the wash of it, if you said Cody was the man that drove what happened in AEW the most, I would find it hard to disagree with you too hard. So, to Cody, shine on, you crazy diamond. You, He is a maverick. He is a man that marches to the beat of his own drum. He is ambitious. He is creative. Sometimes that's a problem. But you know what? Sometimes that also means this person will create just pure brilliance. And I just spent an hour talking to my friend Doc, who lives on the other side of the world, about a match that Cody Rhodes had with his brother and how incredible it was, how emotional it made us both and how it affected us both. Uh, And I, even though I may not watch him as much in the WWE, even though... I'm sad that he's leaving. Look, for the happy memories, I can't be anything other than grateful. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, As I said, you can can give me your thoughts on Cody Rhodes, how you think what's happened affects the legacy of this match um, and the legacy of the other matches he had in AEW and the things that he did in AEW. You know my Twitter handle, Sir underscore Samuel. Big thanks again to the Doc Chad Matthews. If you liked what he has to say, he's got two books, both of them are fantastic reads, um, and you can find them on Amazon. I'll be linking the descript- the, I'll be linking them in the description of the podcast. And make sure you join me next week. We've got another big episode: Eddie Kingston versus John Moxley for the AEW Championship match in an I Quit. Yep, two weeks in a row we're blowing the top off this sucker, and I cannot wait. I'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the AEW Match Guide podcast. If you enjoyed the show, then you can subscribe on the podcast app of your choice so you never miss an episode. Also, feel free to let me know on Twitter at Sir underscore Samuel. I'd love to hear from you. The AEW Match Guide podcast is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network, where you can find many other fantastic podcasts discussing not just AEW, but all parts of the world of professional wrestling. Looking forward to seeing you again next week. I'm Sam Brown.